Eric, you want to do a roll call? Yes. We have Tom DeBee. Yep. Arlene Zorkman. Yes. Josh Jansky. Present. Glenn Pepper. Present. Jenna Reed. Yes. Lauren Selly. Here. Carrie Snow. Present. Molly O'Donnell. Here. Lisa Gallagher. Here. Kendra Daniels. Here. And Sarah Arthur. Here. All right, next up on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our January 9th, 2024 meeting. Do I have a motion? Okay. All right, got a motion. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. All right. I just have Any one, discussion? one question. Okay. Um, on under where it's talking about land donation, it talks about affordable housing at 9th and Terry, but all the uh, information that was sent to us, it says 9th and Terry. So. Uh, maybe that needs to be changed tonight, too, Terry. Good catch. Any other modifications? All right, we've got one modification. Uh, let's vote. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Uh, number three is designate the 2024 official posting location for LHA advisory board meeting agendas. This one, Erica, we are doing this for every advisory board group um, for the year. So the official postings that we've done before are on the City of Buffalo website, so the Buffalo Agenda Management Portal, as well as the Buffalo Housing Authority website, and then the west side entrance of the set of steps here. So if you want that to remain the same, that would just... Anybody have any opinions on that? They just keep it as status quo. Yeah. Last year. All right, let's go to number four. Public invited to be heard. I don't see anyone. Let's go to five organizational updates. Uh, we do have an organizational update. Um, we put the LHA assistant director position out there, and we've had um, a small pool of candidates that are qualified. But we have decided to hire Lauren Selly as our LHA assistant director starting February 26th. So, congratulations. We're super excited and happy. That also does mean that she wouldn't be able to serve on this board anymore. So, um, the clerk's office is organizing a round of board recruitments for the spring. And so, I think that this, because the, your start date would be February 26th, that this would be your last meeting on this board. But she'll, she'll still be here. <laughs> she'll still be here, just in a different capacity. Um, we could just really use that point. That's right. Yes. <laughs> no, no <opinion. laughs> right. So we'll have a vacancy on this board as of the next meeting, and then we'll go through that board recruitment process in the spring. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, housing updates generally. So we're finally getting the housing team globally, both on the LHJ side and city side staffed so um, Katie Hollander you all know will be back Tuesday, Tuesday of next week um, and then we also hired Christy Weissman, Christy Weissman um, to replace dead police as the housing investment manager on the city side so we have um, kind of raided Boulder County <laughs> Christy's my co-worker yeah. 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 <laughs> and so um, I think we're all really excited about <clears throat> kind of the trajectory and the staffing that we're bringing on board and what they can really do for us, uh, just from a capacity standpoint. And, you know, you guys will be happy to offload some work. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. <laughs> I wouldn't call it offload, I'd just say share the distribution in a way that makes more sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go on to number six, development project updates. Oh, there's one more. Oh. Sarah is moving from, Sarah's going to be splitting time in police and development service center. Sarah's going to continue working with us on the housing authority issues, but Sarah is also taking on a coordinating role for what I can tell them what you're going to be doing. So, um, We've had a lot of silos with the smaller um, enforcement groups, so code enforcement, park rangers, parking, um, campus supervisors. Um, those are the, and then, yeah, those are the four. And then we're basically, we 
we've had so many issues because public safety and those groups touch a lot of the work that we all do. And there's no shared data, there's no shared training, there's no shared education really. It's very willy nilly, so to speak. So um, the idea is for me to kind of be that conduit to get everyone connected with all of those things, equipment, um, training, like I said, data sharing in that way. You know, if you have a police officer going to deal with something, they don't know, um, the code enforcement might have dealt with it earlier in the day. So um, that's going to be challenging moving forward. But it's, and we're, we're getting a new record management system of public safety, so I think it's good timing. So that would be, that would be nice. So the benefit for us is I think it's just more coordination with more city departments. So as we're needing certain things or maybe we need somebody to drive by if there's a park ranger and so she's gonna have you know the pulse of everything going on and um, I think at the end of the day there's some opportunities for us on the housing side in terms of how do we even work more closely with other areas of the organization. So lots of changes this year already. So what is your official title going to be then? Is it really long? <laughs> Has it changed? <laughs> I'm, I'm being reassigned. So I'm, you know, between Harold, Joni, and Zach, at least I have three, you know, three to go to. Yeah. <laughs> Zach and Joni are still trying. Um, I think this is there's going to be an evolution to this in terms of what we're looking at, but we know we need to do the work now. So it's okay, we're going to reassign, and then we're going to continue working through to figure out that looks like long term. Now, now does that one public? Sure. Um, so, Ascent is heating up quite a bit. Um, they're getting ready for building permit submittals, and um, there's a lot of moving pieces going on right now. The goal is to get building permits first of July and close on the financing by mid July and start construction right away. Um, that is something the developer really, really wants to hit for multiple reasons. Um, that means, though, that we got to work really closely with building right now. But right now, their timelines are not we're lining up with our timeline, so we're going to have a conversation to see how we can help facilitate. Um, there's new uh, EV electric vehicle uh, parking lot requirements coming out that this project is going to be impacted by, um, which is. It's, it's wonderful for an equity lens for the residents down the road, but in the immediate term, it's, it's a cost hit that we're trying to sort out. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking more about that with you, Harold, but I'm trying to get some information about the steps that they need to take. Of course, they need to take them like now um, to see if there's any sort of waiver to help this project, because it's one of those that are in progress and not gonna make the cutoff deadline uh, for grandfathering. and it results in about 40% of the parking lot having to be either EV installed or EV ready. And so, so we got around that challenge by having it installed, but not putting in the actual charger. So we're, we're, we're going through all of those alternatives right now. There's, um, so this is every electrical permit that's issued by March 1st has to comply. And, um, this is specifically on multifamily. There's, uh, there's a lot more to it. This is a statewide thing, but we're trying to scramble pretty quick to see what the plan is going to be and how we can figure that out. So I may, if we have enough information, I might, might be briefing the board on this next Tuesday. I'm trying to see if we can get enough information first, though. Um, but will this affect the things. suites parking lot as well? If we're going to have new, to change, I mean, we're eventually going to have to redo that, right? Right, but it's a new electrical permit is the oh. trigger. Oh, so we wouldn't have that there. Okay. And Zinnia's definitely well ahead of the schedule. <clears throat> Um, yeah, it, it's kind of odd because it's EV ready. I mean, there's like three different categories. So one is basically just putting in the conduit. Another's putting in the conduit and the transformer. And then another one's putting in the conduit, the transformer, and the charger. Mm -hmm. And so I think understanding what that mix is mm -hmm. and it's going to be important. I'm right. trying to get cost estimates ASAP right now to just see. Obviously Would this is not budgeted for. Nope. Yeah. Although I do have, <clears throat> since you brought it up, you know, we put the money in for the county request with Martha for some of the solar stuff. Mm -hmm. We could 
look at augmenting that request to take that money and actually connect into the solar system as part of the transformers for the car charging stations. And the, maybe that could offset it because that's also that new technology that will tie into Platte River and 100% renewable in terms of how you do that in a different way, use that as kind of a, another solution. So There's also a state opportunity that's due this Friday that Shannon, or the, the development team is looking at um, that is specifically this Charge Ahead Colorado program. So we're, we're looking at all of this here in the next three days. Yeah, three days. Immediately. Um, to try and figure out what the plan will be. So um, we're just in a lot of that type of thing. Lots of fine tuning and um, firming up costs and, and timelines. The Early Childhood Education Center, um, we have applied for six or so grants. We have received between the city's contribution of $525,000 of ARPA funds, or ARPA interest earnings, and then uh, we applied for $750,000 of worthy costs. We're only awarded one fifty. So we are at the just about the six hundred and fifty. Seven hundred. Let's call it about seven hundred thousand dollar mark out of our three million dollars that we need to include the ECE. Our Colorado Health Foundation app. That's our biggest one. Um, we requested two million because our other Stola Strong Communities grant didn't come through. They are telling us that that's most likely too much to ask for. So we are not. We have not filled the gap on the ECE, and if we do not fill it here by about. April is not going to be a go. So we are furiously out there. I put in one, I did some cold calls. Um, I put in one with the, I'm going to remember the, I'm going to forget the name of it off the top of my head, but a foundation where the, the goals of the foundation align. Um, I'm going to put one in with the Safeway Foundation because um, they do have their, their goals align and you've got the Safeway right there. You can say that the employees could live on site and have childcare. So that one I'm trying to put together. Uh, we're just, it's all hands on deck on the ECE front to try and get that money solidified before we reach the point of no return. Foundation on this one. So they, we need grants. It has to be a grant. We can't have like a, a, a true loan on this one with repayments required. Yeah. And they are, they were trying to set up a revolving loan fund and they wanted to give a million dollars to it, but it would have to be repaid, which we just cannot support. Um, so we're talking with them um, to see if maybe if we went down to 500, could you figure out a different mechanism? So that's still in the works. So we still have that in the works and the Colorado Health Foundation we're going to be here, but we're just planning on it not covering the full thing at this point and still reaching out. So that is go time there as well, because we really want to include it. It would be real shame to get this far and not have it funded when We've got it's just basically the corn design. shell funding. No, uh, it's not the shell. It's it's the build out. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's build out. Um, so we are all hands on deck on that. To so Lauren's point, can you carve out the corn shell? That's, what the need is. That's we're what we did with. Us, we're starting to come to Plan B, okay. which that's when we're on the design meeting, which is right after this. We're going to start saying, okay, can we get a revised cost estimate for just a shell, and then start filling it in as we get more funding over time. That's the plan B, hopefully. Do any other, you know, like big corporations like, you know, Walmart and Safeway have any sort of program like that that, that you've heard of, like Target, for example, or do you think that that, I don't know, Kroger to any extent or anything else major in town? So far, the we've reached out to multiple, just cold call basically, are right. you interested in this? But um, what I've, done so far is really follow like the state's um, child care portal and then who contributes there and who is connected that's the it's just the trail i've been following so far since um plus capacity is limiting the amount of just research time but we did dedicate a good amount to it so just gonna keep working hard on it um for Christmas, we have two buildings that are now getting leased up. They're partially occupied, thank goodness. 
the next one, the TCO is coming next one uh, for the third building next week. And then the fourth building is still a good month out or so. Um, so it is running behind, but we are making moves. So we've got people moving in. Um, and the all of the powers that be have approved it moving to an income averaging project. So we, I think we have just one set of <coughs> consent documents to still sort out, and then all of that will be settled as well. So it's moving <coughs> along. Um, Zinnia moving along as well. I mean, they're they're in full construction mode, still on on target for lease up in September. Can you uh, expound a little bit on Recovery Cafe? Um, the yes. So we've got two arms of Recovery Cafe going now. So first, we were trying to get them to build suites. Mm -hmm. It's it seems unfeasible, infeasible, um, partially primarily because they would have to have a ground lease because the land is owned by the partnership and the partnership would not subordinate a mortgage and so they're having trouble getting a mortgage to complete the build. So um, what we have worked out with them, they had a, a plan B working this whole time, which we knew about and weren't supportive of. Um, they are looking at purchasing a site and uh, building from there in a different location and if the city has agreed that if they still bring in programming to the suites then we would still uh, make a financial contribution to help make that happen and so that is the plan right now and actually they've already started programming at the suites so we're going to be briefing that um, to the board on Tuesday as well where they started recovery or circles recovery circles there and it's been extremely popular off the bat so uh, we have a program lead plan for them that I believe we went over on this group. Did we go over this? Okay. Um, and they're off and running. We've got, we have services, recovery services in house in the suites now. And now we're just planning for, if it really is this popular, how do we build for more, a, a second circle in the week, and then maybe um, we've talked about, could we tap into our VIA contract through uh, the connections to the city manager's office to see if VIA can pick up residents and take them once per month over to Recovery Cafe's current site for their open mic nights, or like social events. Um, so that is the status of Recovery Cafe. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to pull, what I say, at least right now, 12,000 ish. I think we said 10 at first. 10, for, 10 to 12 for my, for my contingency fund to um, help support this project. Um, Part of it is because in other key call volumes that we have from police and fire and you know, need or core responses, the more we can support them in this work, the better it's supporting the overall system. Um, so I can really see an ROI on this one, so I'm going to fund out of my contingency. Um, I think the food costs, every, all the food costs for the first circle have some money to tap into the via and then we'll be watching it closely if we need to do another circle then we'll pull some other funding off of it is. Was... So is there any way that you could tie uh, transportation with the micro transit that's coming out? Yeah we have to see what the um, RFP is going to be but yes I mean I think that's the thing is once we get the RFP and we'll see what that's going to look like um, it could be in that micro transit connection. Yeah, Number seven items for input from the LHA Board uh, for the LHA Board of Commissioners, LHA goals, 2023 accomplishments, and 2024 focus areas. Okay. So we have a document in here. Looks like there's a little bit of cut off, but um so this is something that I plan to present to the board next Tuesday. Um You've seen this. We went over this last year. This group helped um, formulate these goals back in 2022. And then uh, last year we reported on our accomplishments in 2022. And so what this does is report on what we accomplished in 2023 and what we would like to focus on in 24. Um, so I'm trying to think about the best way to go about this. I think I'll do kind of a high level summary of each overall goal and 
what we really focused on and accomplished uh, versus if we haven't, then why? Okay, so our first goal is really about um, resident communications and resident quality of life. So we, our coffee and conversations have been super successful. I mean, they are so valuable. We get so much input from them and the residents really do participate and give us feedback that we really use in, in um, making our day-to-day -day decisions. Um, we also I highlighted on here the extensive engagement process that we went through on the Village on Main. Um, really, the big message there is that the residents at Village got something that the Aspen Meadows residents didn't, just by way of the Aspen project was right in that transition time between the old LHA and new LHA. Um, and so we've used a lot of lessons learned to make sure that we went through this in the way that the Aspen residents told us they wish they would have gotten to do. And so that has been so successful. We have more positive feedback than negative. We have had, we have our first round of residents out. I guess I didn't mention this on our development updates. Um, but our, we have our first round of residents out at the hotel. We have heard no issues or problems or complaints of any sort that are, you know, other than day-to-day -day managing of the small stuff. Um, it's been really a success, I think, the way that we went about it. Bringing in a real re relocation team, a professional relocation team, and having these engagement sessions throughout the last two years to prep everyone has really paid off. Um, we did not finish our resident handbook that we wanted to have um, as like a welcome to LHA, welcome to your community. We didn't finish that, but we did get it started and that will be a focus area for 24. Um, I'm just kind of picking out some highlights, but if anybody has specific questions, go ahead and, and stop me. Well, I have a question about the MSU project and how well that went um, in the different facilities that you guys put in. So we did that at the Hearthstone and the Lodge. Um, okay. They ended up not choosing Aspens to do that, but for each, event it was about a two to three hour class and we had about anywhere it was dwindled between 10 to 15 residents at a time but the residents were coming in and out from both properties interacting Good. so are you going to continue or is that their semester is ending so we just had our last class not last week but the week before okay good are they going to be doing follow-up or a report out or anything like we're that? waiting to hear because of Group that originally started, only one has continued with it with us. So, okay. Um, in terms of other just resources that we brought in and partnerships, we talked about Recovery Cafe. Um, we have the Center for People with Disabilities. That MOU was executed in 23, and that the the services are kicking off now this year. Um, we did complete our community manager's handbook. This is something that the board and staff have wanted for a long time, and that's complete, and we're just in the rollout of it now. Um, research efforts across other housing authorities on how do they measure quality of life, we have not tackled that in 2023, it's really just capacity, but that is something, we already have a, we got a media inquiry here a couple weeks ago about somebody reaching out to housing authorities across the region asking, how do you measure resident um, satisfaction? And we have not done a full resident satisfaction survey of sorts. What we have done is those um, community conversations that was more of a narrative and really trying to, uh, that was as we were building LHA back in 21 and 22. So I think that was valuable, but it's not something that we could measure necessarily. So that's something that we could look at for 24. Um, yeah, I think that's all tied together. Any questions about this first goal at all? Or, or suggestions too. If, if there's something that you see as could be a 24 focus area, that is something that we could consider putting on here before we go to the board on Tuesday. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. I think. Um, uh, goal two is about core focus area, so voucher development, property management, etc. Um, so. This is really focused on that housing needs assessment that we did. So this one is really, really complete. This pretty much this whole goal is complete at this point. Um, the grant that we did receive 
we have fully expended um, as of like January, early February this year. So we'll be closing that out here soon. We completed that housing needs assessment and we um, have a dashboard that helps, that we can maintain over time that will help show our needs and how they change and then in, as a result, um, affect how LHA plans out our developments to see what target populations we should be doing. How often do we need the housing needs assessment? So how often is, are those kind of done like every five years? They are certainly done every five years for right, the CDBG program. And then what we did was, well, give us the CDBG and then some. And so um, at least a portion of it is done every five years. And then for us, it's really um, in the future, if we feel like something has truly changed, like a pandemic or just kind of if we see the needs shifting, then it would prompt the desire to, to do an update. Um, of course, that might be depending on right. funding availability, but we'll definitely keep an eye out on that in the next few years. I think what we don't know is there's a lot of legislation being drafted right now that has the housing assessment as a component. And so I think seeing where the state moves in terms of what they're going to require in frequency is something we're going to have to watch. So generally, yes, you want to the five-year increment. It wouldn't surprise me if there's something that comes out that will probably pull it inside around three years just because the interest in the state and this and seeing what's produced and what that means to your goals. So, and so they can track how... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like more bureaucracy to mm -hmm. yeah. take us away from actually doing stuff to mm -hmm. report. So goal three is really about um, our voucher program. 2023 was a challenging year. HUD did not increase our voucher funding, even though in our mind we met all of the performance targets that should have resulted in an increase in funding. So we're trying to, to engage HUD on that um, and try to figure out why and what to do for this year. Um, they were definitely not answering for quite some time with the, in the fall is not a good time to try and call HUD since they did basically shut down. Um, we also started formulating and did some research around our regional relationship on vouchers and how we work with ECHA and VHP's voucher program. And really in 2024, we'll want to be able to really wrap our hands around that. We've been starting the conversations, but I think that our conversations will start to do deep dives here this year. Overall, we didn't have, we really focused, there was a lot of NOFAs, so it's like a new funding opportunities released by HUD for voucher programs. There was a ton in the end of 2022 that we looked at really hard to see if they would work for us and they did not at the time. And then it really quieted down in 23. Um, there just wasn't a ton out there. Um, but our voucher team, we have a super solid team. They are settled and established and they're ready for the next thing to see can we start really trying to grow this program. So we're primed and ready. We need HUD to be a partner in it and um, have those regional conversations and really try and make some headway on this in 24. Don't expect HUD to necessarily be increasing funding across the board this year, right? Uh, probably not, since we're still waiting to hear from Hearthstone and Lodge to get increased funding. So, yeah. so it's going to be a tough environment, but we're ready. With HUD, though, I mean, do they, when we report to them, do we tell them which ones are part of the housing choice vouchers and which ones are project based vouchers, or do they not care how we divvy them? Do they care how we divvy them up, or is it just. There's a like, max. You can only do so okay, many so of but. Yeah. You can only do 20%. Okay. But our suites vouchers are um, not included in those because they're supported housing. Right. So those get excluded, which is 40 units. And then, so that's why we put the village place them. And then in terms of Yardi, is there any sort of uh, part of Yardi that we're not using for its full effect? Or, you know, the oh, most sure efficient? Is, yes. okay. <laughs> I mean, we found we found several things. And, and just from feedback from other community managers that have used Yardi. Mm -hmm. 
to say, you know, do we have this? Do we have this? Um, you so know, what are I, some of those examples? That so an example would be like they, um, we lost the person that was doing our state reporting. She retired at the end of December, so it was coming on the community managers to do that reporting with the state. Um, one of the community managers reached out and said, hey, can you already do this for us? So I reached out, they said, yeah. I mean, the report's right there. Here's how we do it. So I sent them and apparently it's working. So, um, and some of them had to go back because I don't think Fall River was doing reports. It wasn't in this person's. So they had to go all the way back, but it was perfect because this report actually says, like, when did somebody move in, the changes to their income, and all of that can be reported on an appliance um, standard that the state does. So that was one thing. Um, another thing was the payables, you know, having a better workflow, segregation duties, having community managers see what actually is coming, what what's actually being charged to their properties. There were several community managers that were like, these people wouldn't even show up, they weren't being charged. And um, another one was like, why are we paying for these mats? Let's let's not pay for these mats anymore. <laughs> I mean, those are just some, some examples. Um, we also had them looking at the utilities because that was taken off the workflow just so that we got the utilities paid in time. But, you know, for AMN, you know, you could have um, people at AMN actually have to put the utilities in their name. And so if community managers aren't seeing this, the county doesn't know if it's supposed to be in somebody else's name. So they recognize that or they recognize the problem. Like, did our water just increase? Like dramatically, we had a toilet running constantly, so that type of thing. So I mean, there's definitely, and there's there's probably more in yarding that we haven't even explored that we could be paying for. It's just finding those things. <laughs> I mean, do we have full advantage of yarding, or do we have to pay on the different uses? You do have. So we have a package that encompasses a bunch of stuff that I don't think they set up in the beginning. But then there are other packages that yes, yeah, that you can add on to. So like our workflow and our payable package was an extra package. But by doing that, we went on a different platform and reduced some costs in other areas. So it's just researching and knowing, you know, the struggles that the community managers are having, the struggles that HCV is having. I mean, even HCV has noticed some some workflow areas like they're they're doing stuff separately when there's like a workflow that can actually just move them through the process so little things like that so part of it <clears throat> let me look at yardy on the city side we're moving into salesforce um for starting off with our utility customers and things like that we've been working on you can call it ece but what, what is ECE? i can't remember Stuff Ellen Burke was looking enabling caring oh. communities, which is we also knew organizationally that we weren't connecting across the organization for people that were serving. So we may have core and lead working with someone if they're an older adult, it's highly likely they're working with a senior center. And we just weren't seeing those connections when, it, when we did, it was just pure luck with human intelligence. So um, our utilities uh, went into Salesforce. We've been talking to Salesforce about enabling caring communities. And at the time we started that work, no one had that platform built. So we were working with the um, University of Colorado uh, School of Health, and they were working with an entrepreneur. And they were kind of doing test cases and building things. Within that five years, Salesforce built it. Um, the interesting piece on Salesforce is that, and I asked this question the other day, they have an API that is built for Yardi already that is working with their system. So I want to learn a little bit about that because now we're going to connect the financial side potentially to the human side so that we're getting real-time information in terms of what's happening. And then that in turn works with Power BI, which then starts allowing us to create dashboards. So <clears throat> there's a lot more work coming in this, but it really is taking building these motherships then and then utilizing the APIs that 
can pull the data so that we can start seeing certain things that's happening. And, and I mentioned Sarah because the work that Sarah's doing is going to be really critical in the Salesforce piece. But that also then will help Sarah connect to Kendra or somebody else. And, and what really kind of reinforced this in my mind is so we were dealing with an individual that had a voucher. And um, she was on a payment arrangement because of, of an income reporting issue. And so when I was meeting with her in terms of had an accident, went on unemployment, so couldn't continue on the payment arrangement they were on, and so I met with her personally. And <clears throat> what struck me is she came in and she had the CARES form. Which CARES form in us is utility rebates, grocery tax rebates that they get during the year, but she hadn't done that from the beginning. And so when I started asking some questions, we have 452 people on vouchers. We house four, you know, what, four, what's the number now, Molly? Four. Uh, 423. 423. Oh, sorry, did you say on vouchers? No, we, so we have about 800, okay. 900 people, right? We are not internally proactively signing them up for the CARES program, either on the voucher side or on the housing side. And and so when we look at their disposable income, we've got to figure out a way to do this. So Eric has started to work with that with Maria to put together something where when we house someone either through a voucher or in in one of our units we're automatically pushing them into the CARES program so they get these other benefits from the city. So it's kind of that glimpse into one person. To your point about Yardi and then Salesforce is you need something that's connecting the dots uh, because they're missing out on the other benefits that we have as a city. So we're going to continue working on that. Good. Um. Goal four is really all about development, which we had plenty of headway. Uh, we kind of talked about most of that already. But the one thing that we did not get into was affordable assisted living, which you'll see in, it pops up in a couple places on here. Um, and that really was, I think we reported on this briefly in the past, but it is going to be extraordinarily difficult. Um, we talked to people that have um, uh, done affordable assisted living and you know, you have to get into the Medicaid reimbursement world. One of them flat out said, don't do it. <laughs> um, like, it's, the system is not ready. It just is not ready for this. Um, and we were hoping to maybe, rather than, we can put money into development, could we then instead like buy space at an existing place? But that's an ongoing funding commitment. And what we ended up having was with construction costs, escalating so high compared to when we first set our ARPA allocation. So this is all stemming because we originally set aside a, um, a piece of our ARPA funding to, look, to try and do something around this. And every other project, their gaps rose. We had projects sitting in front of us ready to go. So the city council did say, let's reallocate that uh, amount that was set aside for affordable assisted living and get done what we have and then try and figure out the, the best method to move forward in the future. But we really did a great, it was totally worth the exercise to go through and try and figure out the ropes and what are the key drivers and what do you really need and what will it take? And it will take a lot. Um, but I think that it's still a worthy thing to try and keep on our radar and see what we can do and see how Medicaid reimbursement falls together and things like that. So that's really unfortunate because it's such a high need and it's close to impossible to bring together. Okay. Um, oh, and I will say on this, there's a lot in here mixed in this development is, is um, converting uh, housing choice vouchers to project-based vouchers. So we awarded out all 44 of our project-based vouchers this year. And so the village place Village on the, the village, just gonna say the village, <laughs> cover the bases. Um, that's already, we've got a half ready to go, and those 
Uh, units have been assigned. We did a lottery system for the residents um, to get into those units, which is super, super valuable. Um, so that is taken care of. And then the other award uh, allocations went to Ascent. So that will be coming on board and we will be working towards that, getting into that into a half contract as well this year. And then the Atwood project, which they're gonna attempt to go for line tech financing again. And so we'll just kind of hold those um, and see if they get successful to be able to do those. So that was a big goal. When I first came on to LHA, starting to transition in in 2021, that was something that Kathy and Karen really wanted to do just for um, health of our voucher program and to support development. I will say that we get um, development proposals all the time and they always want PBBs and we are fully allocated at this point. So our answer right now is we don't have anything available and we are, we, until voucher funding increases, we won't have anything available. So that is an unfortunate limiter for future stuff um, because everybody who does want those. So that our future developments, we won't be able to add any DVs unless we get additional web funding? Pretty much. Thanks out. Um, well, and we may have to shift reality and some other things. That, uh, there's an interesting opportunity that has presented itself um, that would require us to finance it in a different way that would be both affordable and attainable. What's interesting is it's the same group that's working on the Atwood project. It may be while we need to write this down, we actually have a conversation about sliding them over into this other project if we could. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a challenge. There's nuance there. Yeah. Okay. Um, next is our preservation of affordable housing. So obviously, Village on Main was the biggest um, target here, which we're on track with. We did put um, Hearthstone and Lodge is on here for the 202 program. So we did do a lot, make a lot of headway on researching this and figuring out what will this take and what will it look like. And so we met with HUD um, to go over what their process is. And of course, it's very prescribed and the timeline is very specific. Um, and so you have to do it within, nine, you have to complete it within 90 days or something you of have your, to get your budget. budget approved within days yes. of your contract date. So, so you have to time it extremely intricately. <laughs> well, they're not approved today. So, I mean, it's, I know how to you, this, you would almost have to make sure you're with, you're under their threshold of just, which is usually 4%. So if we just had a 4% increase, we'd probably be approved already, but because I asked for more, that's why our projects are open. So, and so this is planning an entire development with a refinance, rehab and having it all set and ready to go so that you can hit that 90 day trigger point. Well, and the it's only refinance is the reserve replacement. So they don't get, HUD doesn't give you additional money. It right. has to be you have based to on refinance yourself. what your amount is budgeted for to move to the RAD program. And if you have reserves, that's kind of what they look at if you have reserves to do that additional work, whether it's at the lodge or whatever, to so it's quite specific and has to be very well timed. So we've been in touch with um, uh, one of our consultants that we've used on some other projects, just uh, traditional affordable housing. She knows a consultant that has done this. And so we're engaging with him to say, let's plan this out. And what I feel like it's most likely going to be is we work in 24 to plan this out and be ready to pull the trigger in 25. Of course, if we could get all of these other little pieces to line up. Um, so that was what would be ideal because it has to be 24. We we don't have enough time for 24, but we could plan for 25 if we have enough capacity to actually take this on. Um, I will say in 24, and I'm thinking about you know, our staff that we're bringing on board and Katie. Um, Katie's going to be in construction through September on Village. As soon as Village is done with construction. Well, actually overlapping, we're going to be in construction on Ascent, and then Zinnia is going to be leasing up right at that same time. 
we've got other things in the works too. So it's it's gonna be a real busy year. Um, but we at least want to get that consultant on board so we can see what does this really look like? How big of a lift is this? And how well do we have to time this? So um, we also have on here the resyndication of Aspen Meadows neighborhood. So 24 is year 15. And traditionally in the past, we would, that's the point when we would attempt to start that resyndication process. Um, but we know that Chaffa is really looking for us to be more at the 20 year mark. And we were able to come in under that 20 year threshold on Village on Main because um, the last resyndication, they really only did critical system upgrades and not the rest of it. So we were able to convince them that this should be looked at earlier. On Aspen Meadows neighborhood, we don't have as strong of an argument there. So, and also considering our workload on development that it might be an okay thing for Aspen Meadows neighborhood to come a little bit later. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to start this year with a low probability of success. It could start in a couple of years. Okay. All right, that's development. Moving into partnerships with service providers. So some of this does end up kind of uh, crossing over two of these goals that we the quality of life one that we first talked about so we've got um, I've talked about Center for people with disabilities recovery cafe we've engaged children youth and families to help us with um, service provision at ascent so that's not in place yet but we've got that partnership established and it's coming um, we also worked on our positions to help improve service provision so the resource specialist position, we retooled that to be truly a resource specialist position serving um, uh, seniors in all of our properties, but not necessarily focused at the suites, because the suites really just has a population that has a higher acuity of need. It's more than a resource specialist. So instead, we're uh, redistributing that. We've hired somebody that I have not met him yet, but apparently he's wonderful, <laughs> um, that is just diving right in. And then at the suites, where we've talked about how we're changing that model for clinicians um, and really making sure that we've got that the job description for the community manager there reflects the high duty of need and the trauma informed methods of, of dealing with people. So we've been working that kind of on the back end on this. Um, so there are some partnership ideas on here that came up in 2022 that have not necessarily come forward into a full partnership yet, True Pace. They did come out and did do um, education on Medicaid reimbursables for residents, but we haven't necessarily partnered with them to figure out Medicaid reimbursables for any other you know, formal partnerships yet, but that can still be something that we look to do. And then we've talked to the next slide, um, but the federal funding um, that makes it it free or certainly reduced, but I think it's free primarily through the federal funding for residents um, has really covered that need for the time being. And they've helped us, we've had events with them to make sure residents are connected to the resources to get that and that type of thing. But we didn't necessarily do a bulk agreement at this time because there was another source out there. They're currently doing Kimberly events. The last two weeks and this week are at Austin right now, doing just trying to get more residents signed up and connected. Okay. Um. Well, uh, Molly and I haven't had a chance to catch up on this. I had uh, lunch with the CEO of Mons Peak Hospital, which is UC Health, and um, <clears throat> we had a conversation about, and I also met with the CEO of Centura. So the three of us are going to have conversations about the hospital systems, how we can work collectively on something, even though they're in co competition, but find an area that makes sense to work collectively. And this was the item that I threw out is in terms of working with our housing authority residents and our voucher holders in terms of broader community health issues. <clears throat> so we're going to start working on that just because we know that that will benefit them because the more work that they can do on the front end with individuals, the less likely we are to have emergency room visits. And we also understand when we look at the financial capacity of many of the individuals in terms of the financial impact of the hospitals. There's actually common interest among circulating organizations um, in 
in terms of calls for service, emergency room visits. And so <clears throat> we're going to be having that conversation over the next six months. Do you hope after like a Annual clinic where they uh, we don't know. I mean, I mean, the options, options options are really kind of limitless, and and you know we talked about maybe on on the side of the vouchers or even Aspen Meadow, how they bring folks in to understand that, you know how to eat differently and things like that, and they have their own foundations that can come in and support. Uh, in terms of some of our other properties, it could be that they bring in. You know, physicians or something, and do like a free healthcare or health screening, or we we just, we don't know what it's going to look like. We just know that it's a common issue for all of us. And so, when I look at it on the police side, I live near four properties, and and I see the number of runs that our fire department is making to all four of those properties, and those are health related, and and so. What does that mean in terms of calls for service? They end up then going to either hospital and, you know, how do we minimize, you know, A, the calls for service, but at the end of the day, the severity of the calls where they end up being hospitalized for a long period of time. So we know, and, and, and it's, it's bad to have this conversation, but we know that there's a really significant financial impact. But beyond that, we want people to, well, generally, and and so it was just um, a brainstorm over lunch, and both they both are kind of committed to doing this work together, and, and so we'll see where that comes about. So when you guys are brainstorming, obviously you're talking about you know, the acute things will bring people into the hospital, but I think you know, you just said about some preventative care as well. Oh yeah, yeah, like yeah. You said like eating, and, you know, like some sort of yeah. Focus on yeah, longer-term health goals. Yeah, the preventative piece is key because that's really what's going to shut. shut down. You know, obviously, ED visits will be there, but it's going to minimize that. It's going to minimize the acuity of it the more you're on the front end working with folks, and they know how to charge Medicare. So the piece is they may actually be able to tap into Medicare on some of this if they're the ones that are doing it and they know how to do it and have the infrastructure. Maybe we can bring Medicare resources in. We also talked about once that they become involved, it's how do you get Hope Light or how do you get Salute to then slide in and then have really the broader, all of the systems in the community supporting what we're doing. So I think, oh, and the last, I might need to mention Via, Via, so we've talked about Via a lot in this group, but that was one of the major um, service partnerships that we had going on in 23, and we'll continue that in 24, and possibly expand. Um, there's other, there's a lot of smaller efforts too that aren't necessarily community partnerships, but staff on their own, Lisa and her crew, have put together a donations program at the suites for essentials for those that are moving in with nothing. Um, that has been really a positive experience, I think, and it's just been a win-win. I mean, have we had any issues with it? It's just no, been really we, great. We have residents who don't need the help from the donation wanting to donate, so yeah. it's going both ways. Other residents helping those who need it. I think that's is just telling given capacity is tough but we have managed to establish some great partnerships and we're managing to kind of do what we can just in-house too to make things make things better for people um so the next goal on the last page the really the this is more affordable assisted living so we've now talked about this on the development side and you know maybe modeling different types of partnerships to try and make a dent somehow for now and then really with a long-term goal for this so I'm not going to rehash all that. Um, number eight, formalizing a partnership with a provider to establish facilities for early childhood education programs. All right, so we've talked to SENT, we've brought in children, youth, and families for that. Um, what we have not done, well, we could 
once we get through this process with the ACE on Ascent and we've built that partnership with the Wild Plum, then I feel like we could use, use that knowledge gained to see, okay, what's next? What else could we do? Um, but generally, we've tried to, what have we brought in for families at AMN? Obviously, we only have one true family property existing that's only 28 units, so it's not a, a large number of families that we're talking, but we have brought in, um, I think this was 22 though, when we were doing those connections, seniors to kids connections. We were doing that, um, but we've had, we've been inviting them to some of the Aspen Meadows stuff with the uh, Kaiser Permanente. We've had them come in and doing craft events every six to eight weeks at all the properties. They're now invited to do, come to Aspen Seniors. Um, we have just different, like our single to Mayo parties, going away parties, just different things on the site where we're inviting Aspen the neighborhood into that to start building that whole relationship. Um, this is kind of a, an, an offshoot, but we did also bring in the Eagle Scouts to do a project at Spring Creek and Fall River where they did garden beds for us and they brought, they got Home Depot to deliver plants and so they're, that's a smaller, more targeted, but we are trying to engage youth organizations to try and make some headway. I think there's a lot more we could do though in time, especially when we have more family more families on site. And then finally, home ownership pathways and opportunities. Um, so we have not completed much in 23 on this, but we did hire at the very beginning of 24 on the city side our home ownership program specialist that as we have, and we have the um, the 185 units of for sale affordable attainable housing that we're going to gear up in 24 to do a lottery process and start getting a pool of buyers ready to go. And with that, that now is our opportunity. We have the staff member, and we have the project coming where this is where we can use to kickstart um, talking to our residents about prepare, preparation for home ownership and using the Boulder County Housing Counseling. The, that personal finance coaching program to try and get people geared up. So I think 2024 is a good year for this one. Okay, so overall, those are the goals that were set in 22. I feel like LHA is moving at light speed, that some of these goals are still totally applicable. Some of them were ideas at the time, but the world has morphed. There's a whole slew of things that we've completed that weren't even um, anticipated in 2022 and I just want to kind of highlight those and then see about uh, what should we do in the future. So we, we've stacked three different federal funding sources, which by the way is not an easy job, um, to do ADA accessibility improvements across all the properties and do the new playground at AMN and resurface the entire parking lot at Hearthstone Lodge um, and we'll bring in the security cameras in 24 across all the properties to time for the city system. There's a bunch of capital stuff that we've been working on um, just for, really it is for quality of life and getting our properties to be uh, as good as they can be. And so that is not reflected here, but we've completed all of those projects except for the security camera in 23. We sold 615 Main, which was hugely beneficial to the Center for People with Disabilities. Also, we got services out of it. Also, that was a financial plus for the housing authority. Um, we we haven't. There's nothing about meth on here, but we've been doing a ton of work on that with the the new cleaning company that we're testing out and the meth detectors that we've been working on. So that's not reflected here. Um, I think I might have it on here, but I didn't mention the declutter events that we did. We did it's basically hoarding prevention across all the properties where we brought in dumpsters, we organized an effort for people to declutter what they were wanting to. Um, and I think that all the residents were super happy with that. It was just an opportunity where they don't always have somewhere, to, they would like to get rid of something, but they don't have a way to move it out or put it anywhere. Um, elder share volunteers, I think I did have that in there, I just probably skipped over it. Um, we updated our property tax exemption policy which sounds kind of dry, but honestly, that's it, it brought LHA into the income averaging world and prepped us for that entire world, which is clearly the, the path forward in LIHTC, so it seems. Um, we did the Adrian House, which is in 2019, City Council directed staff 
um, there are multiple houses that the city owns because they wanted to purchase the land for either open space or water, um, and they had houses. And some of them were vacant, the Adrian being the first one, where on the city side, we spent over $200,000 rehabbing it so that we could rent it to a low-income household. And then we completed that, um, the property management agreement, basically all of the structure got in place in 23 for LHA to be able to manage that. And um, we have it ready to go. Turns out renting it is incredibly challenging, um, but we're getting there. It's Will County with voucher programs in Boulder County, going into Will County. Will County Housing Authority is not necessarily super responsive, um, but we're trying to get a household in there, preferably with a voucher. And then we made headway on our asset transfer from LHDC to LHA. The Spring Creek property has one approval left to go um, before it's ready to be transferred into an LHA asset, and then Christman will come next. And so that is still moving forward. We've been working on that, or having our attorneys work on that for us um, over this whole year. And then talking about, we overhauled our city vehicle purchase and snow removal programs, completely overhauled that for operational cost savings and for, to get better service to the residents. So there are some things that are not reflected on here that I wanted to make sure we highlighted about what we did in 23, because it was a really big year. Um, and want that to feed into our plans for 2024 and beyond too. So the question I wanted to ask is A, is there anything that you would recommend that the board add in here as a focus area for 24? And B, this isn't the prettiest way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to spend the time to make this much more of a functioning document, but what I would really like it to be is more of a living document um, that we can add goals to and remove old stuff. So that's an effort that might be for, for the next year, but if there's any ideas from this group on the best way to keep this more alive rather than a spreadsheet once a year, that would be Well, we, Molly, we may help with this too from our strategic integration group because this is a council goal so this is the stuff that i'm going to want to be pulling into dashboards so Great. input or feedback in terms of goals like the closing down lhdc i think that could be just a goal in itself just getting that done is it going to happen in 2020? Well, now it's not closing down, but well, it yeah, is morphing to, yeah, yeah. It's morphing to the, we're, it's, we're trying to use it as a charitable organization. So right. that is, I would say, certainly a goal where we really want, we've talked about how many opportunities have we talked about where if we could have somebody really um, able to focus on that charitable side and the partnerships and bringing that money in, that would be really great. And LHDC is our vehicle for that. Yeah, the Fall River's the problem because of the way that it's structured, it's far out and hot right. when we can do that. So <clears throat> how we work with them collectively and on the charitable pieces, we don't need to keep it. So how can we augment it and get them more engaged? And, and I think the other thing that's changed is with all the development, they are doing stuff now. So there is a different interest in wanting to stay involved. I think where they were wanting to where they wanted to disengage was when there wasn't development going on. And so, um, well, we're just going to have to work through it, but the charitable piece, I think, is the same one. Yeah. Then eventually, the, the, well, I guess we would always keep LHDC then open as a charity side, but transfer all the properties out yes. into yes. LHA, right? Okay. Um, I would just add that maybe the big topic of discussion that's going to start this year is um, IDD housing. I don't think that that's been included. That? Intellectual disability, mm -hmm. developmental disability housing. Um, there's money there. There's lots of money at the county level. They have, there's no levy for the county, so there's millions of dollars to tap into for the services, which are the hardest part to underwrite. Um, most service providers, you can, if you gotta twist their arm to underwrite for 10 years, 15 years, it's impossible. Um, but this is a fund that's not going to go away, so it is more possible. And I have great connections with the side and the HHS. We've been trying to do it at Willoughby Corner Phase Two, which 
I will no longer be focused on. So I would like to address that in the long run side. Um, how do we fit that in? It's not the same as permanently supported housing. It's different, but it has its own issues with Medicare and Medicaid waivers. So um, lots of conversations happening about that. I don't think it'll be something we're able to incorporate necessarily in 2024, but getting some of those conversations started with the state. Because that's through a voucher program that we would target the 811 vouchers. So it wouldn't affect our vouchers to increase the number in our units. So that's one goal that I'd like to see. So this sounds very small compared to that sort of thing, but it sort of is like a subsection under the you know resident quality of life and you know education. I remember Harold said at one of the meetings a while ago that emotional support dogs were like allowed in units, right? That's something federally that if you've got a support animal, it's different. It's like more inclusive than say the dog that can get like on an airport or something. So when we when we were having our meetings. Um, at all the different places, I'm a huge dog person, so I just kind of watched, and there were a lot of dogs coming in and out, and often, um, you know, big dogs, and I, I just thought that something that might be helpful for educating the public is to just, you know, even just put up flyers and resources or contact the Humane Society about low-cost behavioral training, because, the, you know, these dogs are, you know, I, again, I love them, but dogs are animals, and I think like training around especially more vulnerable populations like older people and small kids would be helpful. And then also, you know, as we're continuing to, you know, improve the properties to have areas that are specific, um, you know, just like small areas for dogs and places so people can clean up after them and make sure that they've got a designated place. Um, again, it's small, but I think it's like one of those things that really starts to irk people or can't even be dangerous without having some good resources available, like let through the LHA. So nothing that, or sorry, not LHA, I keep saying that, LHS, long one, Humane Society. Right. Sorry about that. Um, so again, it's something small, but if it just, I saw the dogs coming in and out and I just thought it might be a good thing while we're thinking about minor improvements and properties going forward. Mm -hmm. We actually have a start on that. We have oh, yeah. this week, they're doing a shock clinic um, so not the humane really society, but um, I want to say Millie's, there's a group, Millie's, that is coming in doing a uh, shock clinic for all the animals, for cats and dogs at the suites this month. Great, yeah, that's fantastic. Yes. I would just say, just, I mean, I think, do we have one for like operational just improvements? I mean, we just have a, a goal for that and just listing it, you know, like some of the serves going to be working on in the future. And then, right, and bringing in a yeah. Assistant director, like I've got a million goals in my head, so I feel like that's a huge piece that's not necessarily here. I'm not sure how you phrase this, but I think it's important to focus on actual home ownership, and so that's a goal on there for number nine is establishing the partnerships. But home ownership, just the impact that that has, can be generational, yeah. and so I think building that in is a goal. Important. Yeah, that's actually a good one. I mean, you made me think, you know, there's a lot of people that are living in Aspen, and as we look at the affordable for sale units that we're going to be building at Mustang, I mean, what you made me think about is how do we start working with them? Because if you can get them to move from Aspen into a home ownership opportunity, then you open up Aspen for the more people that need family housing. It's how do you, that's a good point. That's actually a really good goal in terms of creating the And I think mm -hmm. we need to also focus on having a revolving loan for emergencies. Because that's one thing that people forget. Like you buy a house and even if it's affordable, if you're a place, are you gonna pay that? You don't necessarily have the disposable income to put down $10,000. When I lived in my unit, my tankless water heater broke, and thank God it was under warranty. I still had to shell out $2,000 for the labor. So how can we support homeowners in a situation where they have to make a huge purchase? And then education. I didn't know if you buy a condo, you can get coverage under your homeowner's insurance for um, when they levy assessments, huge assessments. You just pay your deductible. 
I didn't know that was a thing until I found that, but other people don't know that that's a thing. So, we do have a CDBG program <coughs> specifically for things like furnace went out, you're yeah. unqualified. But that's Maybe expanding that, if the home ownership it becomes larger, we would be for that. Well, there's you know down payment assistance programs, matching funds type programs. You know, as you're building your pipeline, you get a certain on that now. That is on the city side because this was 23 was our first year of real serious fee and lieu revenues from the inclusionary housing side. I am going we're going to work on and propose potentially a locally funded down payment assistance because um, our federal one is just too difficult. So because we are going to need those buyers to be able to access that. So we'll see. That's that's an idea. We're got to formulate it and then take it to council still, but. Okay, Erica, would you add for me to talk to the baby? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> you really got me thinking to say, well, if I'm looking at our sustainability goals, 100% renewable electricity, can we, and you're talking about a fund, can I create a fund that actually is larger out of the utilities that says we're going to put so much money away? If water heaters and things break, we can pay to convert it, convert it to electricity. But then we put some type of deed restriction on that house that says it has to remain affordable or whatever over time. So then we have a pipeline, and then we have an increasing level of stock. That the utility funds are paying for, but it's actually benefiting them on the sustainability goals that they have. So can we find that? Do you have any other input on the electric goals or for 2024? Thank you. Move on to number eight. President Claudia Light. Anybody have any this agenda item? Move on. Strong on number nine. LHA report. Update on operations. Agency goals report. Number one. So it's just, it's kind of just a fluctuation right now. Um, in September, you can see our past tenant balances was at about $59,000. Now it's at 31. And it's just a process of those tenants <coughs> that get evicted, have costs, try to go through the what, you know, get a payment plan on collections, then it gets sent to accounting, we send it over to collections. So it's kind of, I, I mean, there's nothing on the AR that is concerning. Um, and it's just kind of going to be a fluctuation from quarter to quarter depending on who we have in the eviction process and where they are at in that process on whether or not we have a higher capacity balance versus a lower one. Do you guys have any questions on this? So typically, I mean, we got Suites at Spring Creek are typically a higher tenant, past tenant balances amounts, or are those different? <coughs> well, but, Suites is always going to Yeah, be Suites is higher. higher. It's, it's always going to have those units that are tested. Um, that seems to be the property that <laughs> always has meth units. Um, and so that's where usually the higher cost balances are. Um, and, and the longer it takes to now to evict somebody if they're not paying rent. Um, we did um, decide to change our admin plan, the HCP voucher, which I think is going to benefit some of these tenants because our HCP vouchers were requiring in our admin plan that somebody has to pay at least 50 bucks. But what was happening is that these people have no income whatsoever. They can't pay that 50 bucks, so we're not helping the landlords out. We had some of those situations on our properties as well, um, where lawyers were kind of saying, you know, you're evicting on 150 bucks, but technically you're also evicting the same person next to them that owes more. So it's like, how do you, you know, you have to have fair housing. You can't treat one tenant different than the other. But we did notice a flaw in our system that we probably shouldn't require an amount on our HCP vouchers. 
um, because it doesn't assist the landlords that that person really can't pay the legal fees to do. So we are changing that. What is the current legislative legislature being proposed in regard to evictions this year? Is that totally different from last year? Is it something added or? I have not seen anything come across from Sandy regarding eviction, so I don't know, but we can definitely look into it. I think, I think it's just proposed right now. They're going through the process of trying to figure out what, what's going to stick with what's not going to stick. So if a revisiting just cause or point for cause now. Mm -hmm. So that is going to council tonight, that one. So that's I'm glad this is coming up actually, because they're I'm in the middle of reviewing several of these. The cause one is going to council tonight for a, a vote of support or do not support. Um, there is another one regarding um, there's multiple, there's like five flying around right now. Um, tenant protections. What was that one about, Lisa? Specific one that it's not specifically eviction process, but like we have to just give them a settlement amount to move out. Like we have to pay them to move. <coughs> That's, That's the best cause. That's the best cause. cause. Mm -hmm. It's called four cause now. It's the just cause. They've taken out last year's was horrible. Um, mm -hmm. This year's is a little more digestible, but so awful. Um, but they. What they took out this time is relocation. There's you don't owe for that, and then um, also it, it is still there. But if you if you do it wrong, correct. Yes, um, but not and not if you do it correctly. But it took out the um, the like at least it, you can offer totally different lease at the end of term, but you couldn't do for a substantially different lease in their first just cause, and then. This one also has, um, it, so the financial penalties are there, but kind of secondary, but this one doesn't um, exclude you from raising rent during that. So you can manage your tenants out under this bill by just saying, your lease amount is now $6,000, at least as a private landlord, right? So if you want them out, you can, there's no financial restriction in how you can do that. So you, you, you can't end their lease without cause under this, but you can also raise the rent however much if you want to use that as a manager option, which is what will happen. Which is what will which such I, a stupid, right. like, I, okay, let's make rent really well and expensive, right? So, <laughs> so, in my analysis that I provided to Sandy to, for tonight's conversation, I my analysis centered around basically, I see the problem you're trying to solve, this is solving a lot of things around the problem, but not necessarily diving to it. Um, I am worried about, what, you know, when we are going, when we are dealing with behavioral issues and we're trying not to evict, termination of lease is sometimes the best for everyone involved. And it keeps it off their record and et cetera. So I'm worried about that. I'm worried about no such thing as a month to month lease anymore. Always having 90 days. Um, I, I'm worried about that for the housing authority. Um, but I did spoke, speak to one of the housing advocates in our area about this who helped write it. And the point is, the reason that it is going forward in this form is that they hear a lot about how um, tenants are just having leases ex turn out basically because of things like complaints about not getting items fixed. Um, and fair housing. And I said, well, fair housing, we already have fair housing to cover that. And there's already something in place money. about- We already have the habit. And we already have those things. Too, and so apparently people are finding ways <clears throat> around it and they are just seeing a lot of people um, being turned out of their leases for reasons that seem to be not, this is her words, the advocacy role, not worth the impact to the community and society, where we're then having people unhoused and subject to having to find new places with higher rents, basically. Um, so that's, I see what they're trying to do. The mechanisms, my recommendation on the mechanisms is not quite targeting the right issue, but. Well, so under the new four causes, the just causes, is that 
one thing that a private landlord could do myself is just turn them out via a massive rent increase, right? Like, which you guys unintended consequences and you get, are the housing authority wouldn't be able to have that same right. Um, you'd be stuck in right. where I could just be like, I don't like you and want you to go. Your rent is now right. I don't know, whatever I wanted to make it, so I need to pay that. Which is what I'll do. I mean, that's exactly what. So that's an unintended consequence that I think is not worth it. And number two, another unintended consequence is this looks so unattractive to rent to lock yourself into such a massive commitment that I'm afraid that it'll discourage landlords from renting period, which then drives our costs up overall anyway. So those are my concerns. I let a unit, because of the new eviction protections that came through last time, I let a unit sit, and I've never done this before, I let it sit for five months and because I just couldn't find someone that I thought was gonna be great. I would've never done that before, and now you're, you're super careful about what you're thinking about doing. It's just stuck with them. You're, you're literally married to this tenant. <laughs> and it's, you know, and so I, I would, as a private landlord, I'd rather like sit. And it, it's, that is an unintended consequence that we're not trying to and that's promote. What, I mean, so. I definitely, talking to my landlord, small landlord peers, they're really saying, we're just taking them off the market altogether, selling them. Leaving them vacant. That's just my two cents. You know? Yeah. Anytime they start sticking their fingers on it, it makes it there's always residual. So, so I mean it's we've kind of seen it in a lot of places. Um, we've seen it in criminal justice reform and other places where they they don't I mean they don't take the time to understand how the world works, mm -hmm. and so they're legislating to the exception mm -hmm. of the rule, and then the unintended consequences just start snowballing. I mean, mm -hmm. not that it's housing, but the, the best example of this was um, car theft legislation. Mm -hmm. I mean, they shifted it so dramatically that Colorado went first in the nation in car theft, mm -hmm. and because there's no penalty. This is exactly what's going to start happening, and the unintended consequences. People like yourself, if you know, if you rent homes and things, are probably going to start selling. Them. Awesome. I mean, and our, we have two single family homes in our portfolio that are multi family. As soon as they vacate, those are going up. Right. Like, we're just stuck. We're, I've had I've been approached by a REIT to bundle it and sell it, and I, I would have never considered that before. But now, I mean, and what's better, a private landlord who lives in the community or a REIT? Texas. How are the tenants going to be better off under the roof or with me here? Yeah. I guarantee they're not going to be better off. So you're just going to, especially in that middle market, like the 25 to 50, where it's still mom and pop, but you're managing right. a larger portfolio. I I I hear that people are just done. Are you okay with me sharing that? Sure, of course. I'd be more than happy. To, I mean, I, we actually, for the first time ever, had to put a. Um, firm on retainer for attorneys because I just can't the, the changes happen so fast and quickly in every legislative session that I no longer as a private manager can even keep up but I mean I'm spending so much money on legal fees and figure things out it, and this next session like I would redo my lease I just redid it and, and the lawyer that I retained was like why why even bother we call it in June it's going to look completely yeah. different yeah. Well, so, you know, yeah, you know these, these outside, you know, the states that have these owners, we have no way, when we have problems, we, we, it, it's like a, I'm trying to hunt down an owner of a vacant lot right now, and it's, it's a nightmare, let alone yeah. a, a rental. It's, it's very difficult. So if you want, you can, public invited we heard is at the beginning of the meeting. This will be at the end of the meeting, so it might be a little bit of time, but you can always stand up and speak to that if you'd like to. Of course. Check out my chest right here. Or if not, I think it's important for us to take what you just said. Yeah. 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 And move into the REITs, and, and if they think they have a problem now, wait till the REITs start 
playing their games. And They're not going to let Mike Smith pay their late fees and so they do have to me. Right. <laughs> right? Like, I'll take your late fee in a, in a pot of facility. Like, I right. literally have a tenant who does that. It's like, sure. sorry, that's sorry, that's late. Here's your suit. You know, and I'm like, I'm great with that. But it, it would be really, I mean, and in terms of like single family homes or the larger occupancy, the yep. four bedrooms plus, that is going to be so diminished in terms of rental stock. I think at this point, you know, so we're, seeing, we're seeing year. less and less pro se in the official court. You just more can't lawyers do representing. Yeah, you got it. The negative thing with the client is, I go through this all the time with one particular agency. Their lawyer fees are twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for the time they do an eviction, mm -hmm. and that gets dumped back on the tenant. And my last was like two hundred. Yes, my attorney's fees for eviction. We said this, you know, three Susan and I and Joan Beck, a bunch of us have talked about this for years that that's exactly what's starting to happen is these mom and pops are gonna sell out the real estate corporation. They're not gonna deal with it. Yeah. And your lawyer fees are gonna be even higher. Exactly. So we don't the LHA board does not necessarily take a stance on on legislative issues. That's definitely on the city side where I'm doing the analysis and such. Um, but I feel like this is a valid conversation to be having here each year during the season and going over some of these. Well, as a large housing provider directly affects right. the LHA, like yeah. how, do you, how do you manage your, how, how right. do you screen your tenants? Who are you having? Can you get rid of it? I mean, how much does it cost? It? You have the same issues that mm -hmm. any third housing board has the exact same issues that any private landlord's don't. So maybe even if it, because when I submit the analysis, I'm talking about you know the city pers program's perspective, and I go into what the community impacts could be. So in this case, landlords, which includes LHJ. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we don't have the LHJ board direct directly taking stance, it goes through the city, and we're considering it kind of in both ways. Um, so maybe next meeting, if we still have some of these um, in progress. We'll in each legislative season maybe we'll start to bring some of those to this conversation and, and tonight when sandy goes over this i'll jump in with sandy and say look this did come up in the housing authority meeting and there's a lot of concern based on the unintended consequence of reducing the number of local landlords mm -hmm. and selling into REITs because this presents too steep of a challenge to deal with mm -hmm. and so i'll figure out how we how we jump over this one it's the loss of, sorry to pitch up, but it's the loss of local landlords, but it's also just the cumulative cost. They are will be borne by the tenant. I mean, that's, yeah, you're just yeah. going to pay, it cost me $1,200 to evict you every, you know, three mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to raise everybody's rent by that much so that I can go over it. So. Yeah, that is, and, and in terms of the cost of living, I mean, that's going to be a huge challenge. Yeah. The only way to, now if you're stuck with that tenant and you're more married to them, the only way to get them out is to, in the private space, would be to raise their rent to the past level, or in the case of the housing authority, you're going to have to, it's going to, in order to, instead of just saying, look, this doesn't work, it's not working for you, it's not working for me first, your lease is over, and now you're going to have to go down the path of actual eviction, right now, which is a, a worse, a worse scenario than any lease of any so the other one out there that I've sent around to Susan and Lisa so far to help get some feedback on is um, this is the warrant, the breach of warranty of habitability. Have you been familiar with that one at all yet? Yeah. I'm just getting started, so I don't have anything yet. But maybe if we put this on next month, if I, if we're still, I don't want to wait too long and make sure we get this in before they start talking about it. But that is another one that's on our plate. I sent you a calendar invite for today. Notice last minute that the apartment association is doing a 30 minute legal thing on all these today. Okay. Can you record that? Are they recording that? I'm not sure, but. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the one last night, so. They're safe. See if they're recording it. They are. Thank you. The city doesn't take a position on every single uh, proposed bill, but on ones that seem significant. But we so, never touched these bills until the housing authority became part of the city. Mm -hmm. Once the housing authority became part of the city, Sandy started forwarding them to him because it wasn't anything that we were necessarily involved in operationally. 
Well, but the state is taking more, I guess, aggressive yeah, approaches yeah. on this, like the ADU issue and stuff right. like that. Yeah. Going to last time, so. yeah. And they're kind of going into, you know, the municipalities and counties form of governance at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. My wife's going into real estate. They're talking to some friends and they're like, well, you can get into real property. So I'm just sitting there going, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Don't do it. So. Which is bad, right? Because if I'm sitting there as an individual telling my wife, do not do this, and she can do what she wants. But seeing where I am and, and, and saying that, what is that about the supply? We ended up here. Were we talking about a council yeah, we were talking about <laughs> to, uh, property and financial reports for the fourth quarter? Yeah. <laughs> so guess what? We do have a lot of legal fees this year. Yeah. 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 Budget overruns. Um, we have utilities. It was usually the, the gas that was over on those properties because we couldn't, we didn't budget in time um, for that increase. So we saw um, gas prices increase on all of our on all of our properties. Um, we have insurance. Um, we have insurance repairs and non-insurance repairs happening um, because of our insurance rolls over in September. Any claims before that, if there was not recovered, any claims after that, we're not covered. So we have to see about past moving forward to get these units. Hopefully this cleaning company um, will be our godsend <laughs> um, and, and help us out along the way on there. Um, and, then, and then we have legal costs and a lot of inspections. And yes, we are doing the same thing. The legal costs are going back to the tenant and then that goes to collections, but we have it. I mean, we've sent about $400,000 over to collections, and yeah, that's a lot of thing. And I don't think it will see anything, mainly because a lot of it's just costs and fees. Um, I think we might be able to see stuff if it was rent. There are, there are some that have rent tied to it, and at least if it does have rent, then we can take it to those credit agencies to show that, but if it's too easy, yeah. So, do the tenants get money from the work program? Do they, they get eviction or you know, the eviction? Um, I don't know. It's a program the tenants use when they can't pay the rent. It's a county program to get money to help cover that. that was it's it's a, it's a, still one. It is. That's yeah, we're still getting we're still getting money for the. I got money last month. Oh, that was surprising. They're not giving any new applicants or anything. There's another one out of Susan and I were talking about out of Jeez. yeah, but it's very hard now because now they're taking anybody who has just a late notice. Or what they're taking is people that have have an eviction hearing, and they're starting to get so overwhelmed that they're turning around pretty quick. Starting to drag out. Yeah, she says they're about to log back log three to four hundred right now. So my it, question is though, do our tenants do that? And would it be worthwhile for us to step in and help them with those programs before it gets to the point where you get involved in lawyers and lawyers and all those kind of things? But that's the biggest issue I see with the tenants when I deal with on Fridays is they're out they're in the eviction court before they can apply for money and by then they've already accumulated a thousand dollars of eviction fees, which they are all paid for. Well and I don't know how many you might know the number of this is actually how many of our patients are related to and i think you even commented once you know on the docket it was never because of rent not being paid it's usually for something completely different and usually probably involves rent in the same process but it's not the reason not just recently actually. we had a few rent ones but typically if they owe rent and we are trying to hook them up with every resource here and i work very closely on this like have they gone to the arts center? Have they gone to senior services? Have they gone to a woman's work? Have they gone through this? And I go to Susan before we even hit the document. That's a lot of work. So unfortunately, our, but what happens is we inflate our revenue because we're charging the tenant, and then we also inflate our debt, debt expense because then we just write that that off as soon as it goes to collections. So it's kind of a, it it washes really in the end on our financials. Um, because of that, unless we get money in 
Well, I guess it goes back to something that you were saying earlier. What's the cheapest route, route to go? Take them for lawyer fees and all this, and just um, run out the end of the lease and get them. Um, I think the situation is, yeah, I mean, it's severe. Yeah. You could let it ride, but if you have a significant issue with that resident, then that's a, that's a long time. I'm just, just talking about, I'm just talking about money. Yeah. I think a lot of times on the money side, we do try to work with them and find other solutions. And I mean, it's it's really, I think, on, if it's just purely financial, if we're ever pulling the trigger on an addiction because of financials, it's because we have tried to work with them and find different solutions and they have just not worked with us. And at that point, the number's pretty big. But, I mean, it's, I would just say there on the financial side, from the housing authority's perspective, we're, we're leading them to where the resources are, and they're just not taking it. And that's typically, I think, when we step in and go, okay, we've got it. If you see rent connected in the other ones, it's because the issues are so significant that when, you, when you're trying to deal with a significant issue, obviously what you do, you put everything in there to say it's multifaceted, but like I said, I can only think of what, two or three things so? yeah, on rent? It's, yeah, it's probably the last six, eight months we've taken in three for rent. And I know, at least on the ones I negotiate, and this is not rent, but this is HCP vouchers, so it's termination of the voucher. I have probably, what, seven or eight settlement agreements that is really above, what is it? Three thousand or five thousand. Yeah, we have quite. I think we have probably anywhere from twenty to thirty. Yeah. People that owe money back. And and so the way it works is, um, Kendra and her staff can do it if it's below I think two thousand. If it's above two thousand, then they sit with me and we work out the payment plan. So we to the point twenty to thirty of the twenty to thirty that we've had, I think there's only been at least on the ones that I signed. Thus far, there's only one that we've had to terminate the voucher because they didn't stay in compliance with the agreement or come and talk to us about why they couldn't. So it's a rarity for us. So if it's not money, and taking that out of the picture for me, like you said, you don't know about that. What are we really looking at people for? I don't it's see them anymore since I can't. Disturbances, um, could yeah. be a community, um, you know, like outbursts in the community kind of consistently. Yes. I know they're getting the 30 days, they're, they're violating that. Other um, harassment. Significant behavior issues that have occurred over time and multiple occasions. Um, people make it as a jaybird in the hallways, mm -hmm. a couple of occasions. Um, I don't have that in my name. Um, breaking, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of, that's kind of the uh, breaking into our facilities, threatening other tenants, um, loud disturbances that occur on repeated occasions that's disturbing everyone else. I mean, it really is that significant behavior. Even minor behavior, if they work with them, you know, it, we, we don't tend to go down that road, but it's the significant issues. Are there a good deal for, again, taking meth out of the equation for, for an app, but for other drug-related evictions, people like selling far or anything like that, or it's, it's, it's usually just actually physical behavior? Yeah. Yeah. We, have, we haven't had any, any selling Probably one. one that we at least suspected. Okay. At Village, very public. Right. Right. Sorry, that was. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about it. That's old. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying to get Adam's help and whatnot. I was just wondering if very like, there were some drug crimes that we were victim people. That is extremely rare. The, the challenge on that, and this kind of gets into the suites and the security conversation that we've had. That we had we had this conversation with DOH and uh, MHP, and why do we have security there? Because I would say the area where the suites is located, it's not so much the other tenants selling to them; 
it's the people that are selling that are kind of trolling the area to facilitate it. And so for us, part of the reasons why Sarah and I talked about this, why we need security there is as much to do with the outside influences and the threat to the individuals living there as it is with probably I would say maybe more of that. Mm -hmm. And then being able to help with the disturbances that we're seeing. But you know, it's um, it's extremely frustrating when I hear from Sarah and others the amount of praying activities that occur not only on our properties but I think around the community generally. Um, they, they know where they live, they know where they are, they're going, I mean, it's just that, it's bad. So December is also when the financials were really like in a negative because we've added the interest and we've added the appreciation. We usually don't have those on a monthly basis because I think it helps our property managers manage their budgets. Um, and, and it, kind of gets in the weeds of things that they're all seeing negative they probably <laughs> wouldn't actually think they actually have money um but that's tendency why most of these are in the negative right um well in terms of the i had a question on financing expenses um what, what are we budgeting for in there is that just interest or are we because a couple of them i'm seeing that they're um they're kind of over budget like quite a bit like even like after middle senior what, what's included in the budget compared to uh, what's included in actual? You know, like, I think it's sweet too. I don't know, I don't know, it sounds pretty significant over. So, I'm thinking, or are they yellow? Is that one yellow? Is that general expenses? Hold on. Yeah, I don't have details. Sometimes I have to pull up documents there. So financing expenses are all those loans. Okay. So it's not just the mortgage, uh -huh. um, and we don't budget for that okay. particular expense that hits every year. Okay. So um, you budget for the mortgage interest then? We do bud budget okay. for the but mortgage not, interest, not the other but we just don't budget okay. for the other ones because then it'll throw everything in the okay. um, So it's any loan that's come in, affordable housing fund, home loans. Um, that are on those portfolios that have a two to anywhere to five percent interest on an annual basis that we have to record. So that's what's in those. And if you want more details to that, like on and you'd like to look at it annually, I have to find that to her. Any other financial questions? Move on to then the uh, voucher issuance cap. So we just recently sent this to HUD. Um, I haven't shown you guys the first page of this. The first page kind of gives you what HUD has given us funding for. So that first set of columns will let you know what HUD is projecting for 2024 to give us, um, what we have in the current year. And those two. Um, I don't know whoever built this this spreadsheet. There are so many macros, but it, <laughs> you enter the data and it tells you if you're going to be um, underfunded or overfunded in two years. So it's kind of why they call it the two-year tool. Um, we don't ever really touch um, the funding proration. That's kind of already set. And then the second set of columns, um, they provide us with what our attrition rate is for the PIC. And what PIC is, is Tracy sends reports to them on a monthly basis to say who no longer has a voucher, who's got the program, um, all the details of um, each voucher, whether new or leaving. And, and they expect our attrition rate is about 10.4%. Right. And the other part is the success rate and the other fields below that like how long it takes us to lease is through Yardy. So Yardy 
also tracks this information. We can pull this report and it'll give us these details. So we can enter those in, into the report, which then goes to the next um, section, which is where are we going to be at in two years? So it kind of does an analysis of what we've submitted, what our actuals are, and what vouchers have been issued. We have seven vouchers issued at the moment when we ran this report. Um, based on this analogy, we will not be adding any vouchers, and we are <laughs> hopefully projecting anywhere from three to four vouchers coming off the program on a monthly basis. So that way, in October of 2024, we can add 18 vouchers for Village Place for the community. Um, but right now, this portfolio shows us coming in using all of our reserves coming in within like fifty thousand dollars so we're going to have to closely monitor this um, because of the payment standards they went up pretty high they went up to about two hundred dollars per month per unit so depending on when those and what we're seeing is because of the taxes landlords are increasing the rents you know they they need and so they're going to the top level so we have to monitor that it is pretty aggressive like you can see one two three five and then this this yellow column <clears throat> over here kind of does an analysis of what it thinks your voucher per voucher amount is going to be per month and that's how it kind of analyzes if you're going to be underrun or overrun in two years by march we'll find out what our actual funding is um, for 2024 and then 2026 and we'll start a whole brand new right now we're still kind of in the old two-year tool and then we'll start to your tool come March when they, when they give them the funding and give us a new two year tool that has our new dollar amounts. So that's where we kind of stand right now. We won't be issuing any more vouchers unless we lose a ton and feel like we have to. But right now, to be able to fund Village Place, their PDDs, we have to start bringing stuff off the program and with the cost increase. I mean, it's right now we have at the end of 2020. We had 426 vouchers, and we expect to be at 412. How does importing other vouchers from other agencies affect this? Um, well, it depends on the type of voucher. So like we have SRO vouchers, and that's on a completely separate program that runs its own path. When we transfer a Hearthstone and a Lodge to a RAD program, those would be on a separate program. They run their own path. Um, we have portability vouchers right now, but we have not been able to absorb them. I think we have about 10 or 11 that have ported into Longmont or surrounding areas um, in Boulder, but we haven't been able to, to absorb them. If people port out from us, it's all dependent on the same thing. Is that housing authority going to absorb them, or are we going to continue to have that voucher? So it's really the port out that if the housing authority there um, absorbs them, then that releases a voucher on our side, which could be part of the attrition rate as well, part of the, part of the reduction. Any questions? All right, public health and safety updates. All right, we are in the process of getting some bids for a security contract for security companies. Um, Eric and I are working on that currently uh, with the purchasing department. And so we're still using the same security that we were using with the suites. So, still so they are, as of yesterday morning, they are no longer there. So their, their contract ended. With, it was pretty much the emergency contract with them. So um, now we're, we're waiting for these bids to come in and work with purchasing. Hopefully, happening ASAP. So we're staying on that. Um, it actually, um, one of the companies reached out to us and asked for us to provide a tour of the suite. So I met them yesterday morning out there. Their, their company is called Code Four. Um, they had four four people show up for a pretty extensive tour around the building, showing them what we currently have going on as far as cameras, access control, um, the problems that we, we see on a daily basis. So. Um, that was the only company that's reached out to us for a tour, so that was a good thing. Um, 
Eric, anything else on the security piece? Um, but we are just looking for weekends, nights, and holidays for that coverage. And then monitoring across the board, essentially when we get our cameras, um, having that, that individual or that company monitor the other properties via the camera. So, um, talking to Harold about, about the MET detectors, it was decided that we we're purchasing two of the newer platform devices to put in um, to you know, where, where we see is needed. We're working on that right now. Um, the, the one we do have that's the newer platform, you know, this is like Groundhog's Day, I'd be saying this, but again, it's, it's successful, but we're seeing the same issue as picking up that carrier, so drain the, drain the battery pretty significantly. So the two we're going to buy, we're going to put when we know we have strong signal strength to then <laughs> make sure that the batteries work. And then we're looking at other solutions to boost the signal strength right. where needed. Because it goes through cell instead of Wi-Fi? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So moving into that, so we're looking at either cell boosters, <coughs> Leasing space, which I'm meeting with Tracy before mm -hmm. the end of the week. Leasing space at these at these properties, so cell carriers would come in and that might be a potential thing that they'd like to do. And we're also looking at next, next slide. So we have three options that we'll basically come down with once we get this uh, leasing space question. If that's even a possibility. Um, so hopefully that is the answer for sooner. For this area. When you say leasing space, you're talking about putting a cell tower on the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would be real careful of that for any future resubmitation projects and thinking about okay. how you write your lease. Yeah. Um, we financed one for Brothers Redevelopment where they had a cell site on the site that just had to be relocated, and that probably had 12 to 18 minutes to the process. Really? Yes. Wow. So just be thoughtful if you do that, how you write your lease to uh, accommodate. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, as far as resident updates, um, it's been it's been pretty smooth. We're going to ramp up coffee coffee conversations starting this week, and I'm really going to ask the residents to put some thought in into what they would like to see from the public safety side as far as presentations, um, what what they want. So, and, and building that out for the year. That's all I have. Yeah. Anything updates from the video director? Yeah. And any other business that anybody has? All right. Well, it's a turn at 10 to 2. Thanks, everybody.